this the last Sunday of July, and we want to thank you at the beginning of all those who sent uh, messages and greetings and salutations celebrating my birthday on Friday. Thank you so much for your kindness and your consideration. Every message was heartfelt. Thank you so much again. Well, today is the last Sunday of our July series. Our July series has been Nothing Shall Separate Us. Next week, August, we begin our August series. The colors behind me will change from red to green, and our new theme will be Because God's How is Our Why. I was asked recently, what does this mean? How does God love us? Becomes how we love ourselves, how we love others, and how we love God. So that's the why. Why do we love ourselves? Because God loves us. Why do we love others? Because God loves us. So our why, our doing, is based upon copying, modifying, not modifying, being a part of God's behavior. So that becomes our behavior because we are made in the image of God. Oh, we'll begin to deal with this next week. We'll have a lot of fun. First uh, week we'll be doing, uh, focusing on, uh, actually all week we focus on Matthew. And the first week is Jesus says, give them something. The story of the feeding of 5,000. Lord, you got to do something. Well, Jesus turns around and says, give them something to eat. Uh, that'll be fun. Uh, the second week is the word is near you. Doesn't feel near. I'm still trying to figure this stuff out. Well, it's right near you. Okay, we'll figure that out. Then the third week is to the lost sheep. Jesus is sending them out two by two and says, go find them. And about this time, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is shifting from saying, I only came from the house of Israel to say, I guess I'm coming for the whole world. The fourth week will be, what, do you, what was that you said? You want to go over that one more time? And then the fifth week will be, Whole facts. Oh, it ought to be a lot of fun. Hope you'll tune in and be with, uh, be with us. Today, we're dealing as, with our last part of Nothing Shall Separate Us. We had the 4th of July weekend, and that was for freedom. We are free in Christ. Two weeks ago, it was the fact that... That doesn't make any sense. Anyway... That doesn't make any sense at all. But last week we dealt with creation, and this week we're dealing with uh, our final, nothing shall separate us. My computer just got this page wrong, and I'm sorry. So again, thank you for joining us today, and thank you for the privilege. David was playing just a moment ago uh, a hymn that has many different words set to it. In my tradition, it's God of grace, God of glory. And the chorus goes, bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. God has set the table before us. We're going to chow down on God's word, God's food, until we just are so sated. We say, I just can't take any more. It ought to be fun. Let's pray together, shall we? And now, Lord, uphold me as I have privilege to uplift thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so we're going to be reading from Romans. I printed out because these words are bigger than I can read in my scripture. My glasses aren't nearly as powerful as they once were. Paul writes in the 8th chapter, beginning with verse 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to the Lord's purpose. For those whom God foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that we might be firstborn within a large family. And those whom God predestined God also called, and those whom God called, God justified, and those whom God justified, God sanctified, that means glorified. 
What then are we to say about these things that Paul has just been talking about? If God is for us, who is against us? Who is to condemn us then? Oh, I love these words. It is Christ who died, yes. Who was raised, yes. Who was at the right hand of God, yes. Who intercedes for us, yes. Who is to condemn us? The answer is ourselves. Oh, more later. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Hardship, stress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? And Paul says, no. May God add the blessing to the reading of this portion of his word. All right. So we start. This talks about being more than a conqueror. So, all this predestined language. Calvin took that to mean that there are those whom God has said, okay, I'm choosing this one, this one, this one, this one, but I'm not choosing that one, that one, that one, and that one. Reminds me, Brett, thank you again for that wonderful painting you and David that's entitled That One, when Jesus, as a young boy, is picking the black sheep. Oh, thank goodness I have a place. Jesus chose me, even me. I am so glad that Jesus chose me. Jesus chose me, Jesus chose me. Are you glad that Jesus chose you? So that's what this predestined me. And Calvin took it this way. Other scholars have taken it this way. Predestined means the Imago Dei. God gave us God's image to think like God, to, to love like God, to feel like God. A heart, soul, mind, and strength. Like God's heart, soul, mind, and strength. No other part of creation got any of that. All of creation was created good, except the man and woman, they were created very good. The difference? In the image of God. Now, God's characteristics were all over creation. That's why last week we talked about creation groaning, waiting for us to catch up, waiting for us to return. A call to repentance, a call to restoration. And that's our destiny. We are given that destiny. We are born to be able and willing and ready to make that decision. And it haunts us. Even when we say no, it still haunts us. Have I made the right decision? Even when we say yes, it haunts us. Have we made the right decision? You see, there's always this, this past that is pulling at us and tugging on us. Who shall separate us from this legacy? Ourselves. It's just too hard to believe that God is faithful and obedient, that God loves us. It's just too hard to believe that God will forgive us. It is so much easier to believe that God's going to punish us until we just give up. Or give in. When interrogations go, and, I, and it makes a person so hopeless. The pain level is so high. They give in. They tell what they know. And then have to live with the consequences of betrayal to self. Dastardly. Is that the way God works? Not in my world. But it works that way in your world. Make it work. I have just as much right to your opinion as I have to mine. But as these things are pulling us, to be more than a conqueror, through Christ Jesus who loves us, is to recognize that everything is working together for good for those who love the Lord. And what that means, it's not that everything's going to go pleasantly, it means that in everything I see and experience and and feel the presence of God. When, in, according to the psalm, when I'm in the deepest part of Sheol, that, uh, thou art there. When I'm at the heights of heaven, thou art there. There is no time and place that God is not with us except when we don't recognize it. And just the fact that we don't recognize it doesn't mean that God isn't there. 
It just seems that way, feels that way. Wow. And so, as we look at this more than conquering, we're looking at making that decision to embrace who we are, the image of God. Now, most therapeutic models, psychology, psychoanalytics, those kinds of things, most therapeutic models will say, until a person gets to that point of surrender to who they are, what they think they are, what they anticipate they are, they can't see any other options. They're tied into the behaviors that are tied into the decisions that they have made their whole life. So, so invested are we that when we tell a lie and we get caught, we tell another lie. And then when that gets caught, we tell another lie until the lie becomes the truth. And that's what compromising who we are is all about. Some call that the devil. Some call that hell. Whatever it is called, it is a state or place where I'm living a lie as the truth. And that lie as the truth is it can't get any better. Grab all you can, cause all the mischief and trouble you can, pay all the penalty you can, because it can't get any better. Then how does it get worse? Because we're in a path of depriving ourselves of hope. Deprives ourselves of hope, we deprive ourselves of love. We deprive ourselves of love, well, where does it end? And here comes the truth. God zooms in. Those shepherds out in the field, the birth of Jesus. God zoomed in. Hey, guys! We're up here as if, as if being so bright that the shepherds had to shield their eyes. The shepherd didn't know that something was up there. Adjust your eyes. We're here. We got good news for you. Imagine shepherds. You got good news for us? We're shepherds. No, you got good news. A new baby's been born. Go find it. And see in that baby your hope. They went. They found the baby. They shared the stories. They went back to the fields to be shepherds, glorifying God. Did they walk into the village glorifying God? Scripture doesn't say that. Matthew makes a point. Or, I mean, excuse me, Luke makes a point. They're going back to the fields and glorifying God. That's the difference. God comes. God calls. Everything works together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to the purpose. God is calling. Have you picked up the phone? Have I picked up the phone? Have I picked it up today? Have I picked it up recently? Don't you just love caller ID? You decide from the number or from the name whether you want to answer it or not? Wow. God's call. Come home. Come home. You who are weary, come home. According to that great hymn, How's God Calling Softly and Tenderly? Wow. Calling us to see hope, to see forgiveness, to see mercy, to hear forgiveness, mercy, to experience it. Like the thief on the cross. Lord, remember me. Now what's the other thief saying? Get us off this cross. Get us out of this place. They're both in the same place at the same time. One sees, one doesn't. One asks, one doesn't. One receives acceptance. One experiences rejection. Wow. More than conquerors through him who loved us. How did God love us? Jesus says the greatest love that a person can have 
just to lay down their life for another. God says, all right, I've said it, now I've got to do it. I will love you even when you're killing me. When that happens, if it happens once in an isolated event or it happens more and more and more until it's the most common thing in your life, that is being more than a conqueror. When Israel, when Jerusalem was captured by the Babylonians, and they were taken away. Well, the northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians, and they were taken away. But that's that's not what the Old Testament focuses on. What they focus on with the Assyrians is what happened with that. And they're called the Samaritans. What the Scripture focuses on with with the fall of Jerusalem is that God goes with them. In the same way that God went to Egypt with with Joseph and, and then finally Abraham and then and then when everything turned south God led them out of Egypt into the promised land now they're over in Egypt again except this time it's Babylon and God's going to call them out of that God says I haven't forgotten you well Lord it seemed like in Egypt you've forgotten us it was only four or five hundred years yeah it's four or five hundred years well that's a long time I suppose so. That's the way I imagine God responding. But I was with you always. So that when my word came, you were ready. That's what he said about Egypt. Now, Ezekiel is saying to the people in Babylon, God's with us. We don't need the temple. God has flown with us. God has gone ahead of us and made a place for us so that we who are in captivity we'll be able to say to our captives, you may think that we're slaves, but we are free. The day will come when we leave. Imagine the boisterous laughing going around that. But it happened. This time, only seven years. And now the great exodus from Babylon Back to Jerusalem. God is calling us and inviting us to invest ourselves in who we really are, not what we think we are, but who we really are. And God is telling us who we really are. That wonderful film called The Help. The maid is, is saying to the small child, you are brave, you are beautiful. And one of the things was I can't remember right now. Oh, imagine hearing that every day of your life. When I was in college, I refereed uh, different sporting events at the Jewish Community Center. It was a wonderful experience. And really, for the first time in my life, I saw Jewish motherhood at its best. Mr. Couples, my son is, my son is a great basketball player. He couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. He is a great basketball player. Imagine hearing that every day of your life. You're the best person in the world. And some, then some comes in later in life and says, you stink. Whew, there's, there's an earthquake. Imagine hearing... You're the worst person in the world your whole life. And then hearing somebody come and says, you're the best person I've ever met. Man, there's that earthquake again. Fascinating. God says, let me share with you. Let me show you who you really are. And God shows us the nature of God, the heart, soul, mind, and strength of God, and says, that's your heart. That's your soul. No, 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 no. Well, you've shrunk that. Now let's grow it. Let's grow it until it becomes more than second thought, more than habit. It becomes life. So that wherever you are, in whatever circumstance, you will always know who you are, whose you are. 
no matter how much they insult you and seek to deface you. Well, Lord, what? Brick toil order, what if I fail? I'll be there to remind you. And all you have to do is say, I'm sorry. It's called repentance. Well, as we develop this life, as we become more than conquerors, as we change our uh, capacity and we, we learn this new capacity to see the kingdom of heaven all about us, to speak the language of the, of the kingdom of heaven all the time, one of the things that we're doing is we're developing a prayer life. Most of us don't think we pray very well. People are very kind to me. They say, I, I pray very well. Compared to what? To me, I'm just a kindergartner. Just putting together words, trying to match words to my feelings, words to my thought. Don't want to don't want to detach feeling from thought. I, I, I want to embrace them and, and find a, a sentiment that reflects that. When I'm successful, part of that thing is that pulling me away from from who God wants me to be is saying, this is really pathetic. At the same time, that those same voices are saying, you're so good. You are so good. People are going to get uh, mouth sores because they're eating too much sweet. Can you do that to people? You're so good, you don't even have to bother about people. Oh, those two. Pull both ways. Prayer is more than words. Prayer is more than sentiment. Prayer is more than mumbling. Jesus says, go to your closet, be alone. Prayer is more than going to your closet and being alone. Prayer is a constant conversation with God. God's always in my head, always in my thoughts, always in my feelings, always in my heart. I'm the one who turns it off. A vibrant prayer life is coming home. Coming to the knowledge of who I am in God's image. Daring to believe it and to talk about it with myself and to talk about it with God. And Paul says, it doesn't make any difference if the words are good, bad, or different, if they're right or wrong, if they're graduate level or, or kindergarten level. God knows our heart. And the Spirit is there to translate that. In this case, to remind God. The Spirit is God, so God's reminding Himself. That's exciting. So, Paul gives us a word of grace in these words that he's talking about. The words don't matter. The words don't lead. The word of grace is the heart. The heart leads, the spirit leads, and the words follow. My own particular discipline is someone asks me to pray, I take a moment to focus, to breathe in the fullness of God, to include my mind and my heart and my emotions. What is happening right now that I can transmit in a word? When I don't do that, they're just words. They may sound great, but they're not words. They're just words. That's what Paul's word to us, that's Paul's grace to us. Quit worrying about the words. Embrace fact that you're sharing your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And then we add joy and we add blessing. The Spirit leads with love. We lead with love. What shall separate us? We've asked this question before. Nothing! 
Nothing in this world or beyond it except us. Except us. That's a tough hurdle to get over. Was for me, still is. But now it's just a tough hurdle. Back then it was a tough hurdle. I've decided to uh, get back in shape. So I started walking, I started with 15 minutes, and then I zoomed up to 30, and this past week I made it to 60 minutes I'm walking. Okay. Every time, I, I get to start out, I'm saying, I don't, I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna, oh, go ahead and do it, go ahead, you know you feel bad. And somewhere in that walk, I begin to feel better, and I'm so, I'm patting myself on the back, saying, I'm so glad. Well, the other day, I got a Charlie horse in my left a calf, and I couldn't walk. Instead of being happy that I whew, didn't have to walk anymore, I have a really good excuse. I'm just limping around. I said, Lord, thank you for the blessing. I didn't know the form of that blessing. But I know that when walking invades the heart, it's more than walking. It's walking with heart. And when walking doesn't invade the heart, the soul, the mind, the strength, then it's just walking. That's the way I think of prayer. Will I turn on the heart or turn it off? How is the conquering? How is it a victory? The conquering is in allowing the Spirit to lead, to intercede for us in our prayer life, for our whole life. There are certain things that I can't handle. I know a lot about music, but David knows a lot about music. I love to use the same words to describe the same personality traits. Just different inflection. If I have a significant question about them, I'm asking David. Trust him. And that point of surrender leads to vulnerability, leads to relationship, leads to intimacy. And it's tough to make. It's tough to announce that we don't know everything about everything, especially when we have acted that way most of our lives. So the conquering is allowing the Spirit to speak for us. So. The Spirit can only speak for us when it knows us. And we can only speak in the Spirit when we know the Spirit. And so there's a mutual surrender. And when that happens, prayer is a time, a moment, when we stop and focus. Sometimes we close our eyes and bow our heads. Sometimes we take a dis dis different posture. But prayer is obedience. Prayer is faithfulness. Prayer is a way of life. Therefore, it is life. So we are choosing life and we choose to pray and we are choosing less than life, to no life, to death if we don't pray. Fascinating question, don't you think? Prayer is something more than just the motions. Prayer is more than just those moments when we stop. It's more than just those closet moments, those kneeling moments those tearful or laughing moments. A life of prayer is life. Constant prayer means constantly living. It doesn't mean mumbling a prayer all the time. It means living in the fullness of God. It's living in the constant awareness of the presence. It's knowing that the Spirit is interceding in our lives. It's thinking about us. As we are thinking about God. Prayer is inviting 
God, the presence. It's leaning into that presence. It's longing for that presence. It's trusting in that presence. Even when it doesn't seem like it is there. So Paul ends. What can separate us? All of these things. Let me read it to you. Distress, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. They only invite us to give up. Death, life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, anything in all creation. If they separate us from God, they can certainly invite us. Here comes that serpent. Saying to the man and the woman, you're not going to die when you eat that fruit. Serpent saying, you're not going to die if you give up on the Lord. And we give up on the Lord, and sure enough, we didn't die, except we died. Sometimes it takes a lifetime to discover that. Sometimes we know it like that. The man and the woman in the garden knew it. They knew they were naked. They knew they were vulnerable. They had to hide themselves. They had to make clothes. To this day, that happens. And when they had the opportunity to say, Lord, we're sorry. Can we have another chance? They explained it away. Just like I do. Just like you. Wow. Nothing. that we would call hurtful, nothing that we would call helpful can separate us from the love of God when we live in constant fellowship with God. We are more than conquerors because we are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, hope the meal was helpful. Hope the meal was good. Hope the meal was filling. But this time we come to that point that is inevitable. You and I get to make another decision. For those of us who have walked with God, those of us who are increasing our maturity, those of us who are increasing our intimacy, walking more and more and more and more, moving well past 50% of the time, well past 75% of the time, well past 100% of the time, well past 110% of the time. We say, precious Lord, take my hand. Some who are on a reduced rate of maturation sometimes offer the hand because they know that to offer the hand Precious Lord, take my hand. Means another step towards full intimacy. And so, some will say, take my hand in a moment of desperation. I don't know where you are. I like to think I know where I am. But it comes down to this. This is our hand. In Brother Love, Traveling Salvation Show, Neil Diamond says, we got two hands, one to reach to God and one to reach to our neighbor. Oh, what a great song that was. The hand. The hand. The hand. Just take my hand. Lead me. Thomas Dorsey, David Lewis.
Thank you for that beautiful prayer. Outstanding. Lifted to the highest heaven. Touch my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength. Precious Lord, I said. I was fortunate to know the words. Take my hand. Lead me on and let me stand. I'm weak. I'm warm. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on. Through the light. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead. starting out. Those towards the end, we've all reached out. God has made us more than conquerors because we have moved from death to life, chaos to water, darkness to light. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.